Good evening and welcome to tonight's live lecture. I'm your host Patricia Simpson, Director of Political and Career Programs here at the Leadership Institute. We're joined tonight by Carla Bruno who also works at LI. She's currently in our development department but has a long history of holding elected officials accountable. Carla, how are you tonight? Fine, thank you. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks for being with us. I do want to remind everyone that this is, in fact, a live webinar, and you can ask questions at any point in the evening by emailing your questions to live at leadershipinstitute.org. Those questions will come directly to me, and I will ask Carla the questions that you have. Uh, if you miss something, if you need to step away at some point, we are recording it, and it will be available within the next week on our archives. But I don't want to delay any longer. Carla, what do you have for us tonight? Well, a lot of good things to share. Um, I should qualify a little bit about what you said. My long history is actually not that long. Um, I actually was an English teacher and a, a, just a regular person who voted conservatively but wasn't involved in the process. Uh, but uh, about five years ago when Jean Nichol was president of William & Mary, I got involved heavily. And so tonight's talk is going to be partly about elected officials, how to hold them accountable, but also partly how to hold uh, officials accountable at a pub public university. It's called Show Up, Speak Up, and Share because those are the three elements that are really important to make this, to have victory at the end. Uh, the bad news, the problem is that there's a, an incredible lack of accountability and transparency for elected officials, college administrators, and college professors. Uh, the good news is that that actually opens up uh, room for grassroots uh, for students and just average citizens who want to uh, make a difference by speaking up. So the problem's there. It happens all across the country. It's not unique to William & Mary. Uh, and it's, it's just an opportunity. If you look at it as an opportunity, you can make uh, quite a few changes uh, as you go along. All right, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, Supreme, Court, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis uh, was talking about accountability and transparency. And truly, truly, the more sunlight you bring, the more light you shine on an issue or a problem, uh, the, the more people on the other side seem to scurry away. And the problems uh, seem to um, dissolve, shall we say. One of the first things you can do, of course, is to show up. A lot of people like to complain. They like to sit around the coffee table and, you know, or the at a pub at, the, at school and, and just complain about what's going on, but they don't want to actually do anything. And one of the most effective ways to fight the injustices and the liberal bias and indoctrination that's going on anywhere is to show up. Uh, for elected officials, you, you really want to show up at press conferences, if you can. I mean, obviously not everyone can, but if you're talking about holding your ele uh, local officials accountable, you can certainly show up uh, to as many press conferences as you can, town hall meetings. If there's a telephone town hall, you can try to get onto that. Uh, we've had great success with radio call-in shows, um, being prepared with questions, uh, asking uh, Questions that are, are, are intense on a radio call-in show can get you some really good quotations to use. If you're an investigative writer of any kind, you can use the quotations, either put them up on a website or use them in an op-ed or something like that. You should show up at routine meetings, um, political party events. It's, it can be hard. It can be very hard to show up at, at events, especially if you're working full-time. Uh, everyone has other responsibilities. Um, but showing up is half the battle. Uh, at William & Mary, I, I actually uh, go to board meetings, quite a, f quite a few uh, board meetings. They, they kind of expect me there at this point. Um, it's, it's showing up is half the battle. So once you show up, if those are for elected officials. For colleges and universities, you can go to the trustee meetings. Uh, it's certainly at, at William & Mary, a public university, the meetings are all public. The problem has been that uh, they'll call it a public meeting and then they'll hold it at someone's house. And it takes a, a brave person to actually show up at, at, a, at a, a CEO's house and say, I'm here for the meeting when you know everyone's there having dinner. Uh, but I, I've done it, and, and you can do it too. If it says it's a public meeting, then be brave, show up, and bring a, either a camera, a recording device, a notepad, whatever it is you need, bring it with you, and uh, you'll get a lot of useful information that way. You can all show up at hearings or panels. Uh, they're, for William and Mary, they're going through a crisis right now with curriculum, uh, which is not the most exciting thing. It's not as much, it's not as interesting as having the cross taken out of the chapel, but it's important. It's very much important to the to the uh, 
to the value of a William and Mary degree. And so the hearings, the panels, any kind of discussion on the curriculum is, is extremely important. And they, colleges are very insular and they don't like anyone from the outside, so to speak, coming in and, and horning in on what's going on. And I have two degrees from William & Mary. I keep reminding them I'm not an outsider. I'm actually an insider. Uh, I'm twice over, I've got two degrees, and I have, I have a right to be there and to, to voice my opinion. And they're getting used to it. Uh, but show up when you can and be prepared to ask questions. President's office, you could always make appointments. You could come in uh, to, uh, to talk <laughs> with him or her about what's going on. Uh, the provost's office, the same thing, showing up at faculty meetings. Uh, again, you, you, might get, you might get a few odd looks as you go along, but showing up is half the battle. We do have a couple questions okay. coming in. The first one is, how do you handle politicians or administrators that don't take you serious and want to dominate your time, they want to take control of everything? Do you represent yourself as a writer or as a constituent, or a mix of both? Oh, that's a good question. I had I had been accused uh, at William & Mary at a board meeting last year, I was accused of being the media, when in fact I don't even have a blog, so I just get printed in the paper quite a bit. Uh, my answer is I'm, I'm a concerned alum. Now, if it was a public official, I would say I'm a concerned taxpayer. Um, you know, you're spending my tax money uh, in whatever way, and I, I, I have a right to be here and, and speak my piece. It's a free country. It's America. We're still a free country anyway, last time I looked. Okay. That, that is the one. That's the one question yeah. at the moment? Okay. Hopefully that answered the question. Uh, try not to be intimidated. I should also add, try not to be intimidated uh, by the powers that be. They're, they're people just like everybody else. They're just, again, insular, and they're not used to having someone question what they're doing. So if you're polite and uh, ask reasonable questions, uh, you know, reasonable people can't accuse you of being ugly. They can't accuse you of being hateful. They can't accuse you of anything at that moment because all you're doing is asking a reasonable question at a reasonable time. You're not, you know, it's not a bad thing. So they have a hard time arguing with, with that kind of rationality. All right, you can, if you're a student, I should add too, show up to classes. I know that's, that sounds <laughs> Crazy, you know, show up to the classes that, that, uh, that maybe are, are a little bit heavy into the liberal indoctrination. And if it's a class that you're in, and you've actually enrolled in it, and you're allowed to take video and record things, you should. You should. All right, so you're showing up. Showing up's half the battle. The other half of the battle is speaking up. So speaking up in public, this might go a little bit to the earlier question about how do you handle yourself in public or if you're talking to an elected official, you have to know the facts. Uh, you can't rely on the media. I know that's an that's, that's a, a interesting way to look at things, but you really can't rely on the media. You have to do some digging, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit, on, on getting the facts and being absolutely concretely aware of the facts so that you cannot be argued out of them or, or intimidated out of them. If you're going to speak in, at a public event, make sure you have questions prepared ahead of time. Uh, think them through. Do not ask yes and no questions, right? Uh, you know, you want something that's open-ended, like what do you think of? Or what is your solution for? Those kinds of questions require an answer on the other side. Um, one of my favorite ways to start a question, and I got this from Morton Blackwell, is uh, how productive would it be to do whatever it is that you want to do? And, and they really have to think about their answer before they get to that. Do not be afraid to take the microphone. A lot of the open hearings and uh, some of the board me meetings will have microphones available, and you should be one of the first people there to ask to stand in line. Because if you're the third or fourth or fifth, you might not get asked. You know, might not have time to ask that question. So be prepared with a question. Be ready to be the first in line to get up to that microphone without elbowing anyone aside. Uh, make sure you have a follow-up ready. Uh, it's important that you anticipate the kind of answer the politician or the administrator is going to give. Think ahead. Go, walk down that in, in your head. Walk through that conversation. What, what might he say and then, or she say? And then whatever answer they have, you come up with a follow-up for that. It helps to be able to think on your feet in that kind of a situation, but it also helps to be prepared, to have that preparation ahead of time. 
One of the things, if you are going to speak out in a meeting or in a public venue, is to avoid commentary. I'm sure we've all been in a meeting of some kind, in a public meeting where someone gets the microphone and they start telling the long story. Well, when I was a kid, we did this, that, and the other thing. Or last year, there was all of the, and 12 minutes later, they're still talking. Or, or in some cases, I've seen a, a monitor come up and a moderator come up and actually you know, take the microphone away from these, this person without being rude. Uh, you want to avoid the commentary. Go directly to the question. Uh, and be uh, as succinct as possible. And be respectful and honest about what you're asking. It's important that you don't sound uh, like you are spitting on them while you're talking about them, which, which can be hard. If you really don't respect them, it's hard to sound respectful. But you should try to be respectful, try to be as honest as you can. That'll come across in your question, and it'll, give, it'll make the people around you, and it will make the uh, panel or, or the administrators, public officials, it helps them have respect for you as well because they know you're not trying to, to jab them while you're asking this public question. So you've got to be brave. This, Another, yeah, talking about public questions and whatnot, one of the great forums of uh, public questions is the town hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a question from someone who is interning in a, for a congressman in a very a heavily targeted district, and the congressman is not holding any town hall meetings. And this oh. person wants to address the fact that he's not and they should be holding these meetings. How, how would you approach that subject with the congressman you're so interning for? They're not being transparent. Correct. They're not being transparent at all. And they will hide as, as much as they possibly can. You can, um, you can ask yourself. Uh, that's one way is to just keep mm -hmm. asking. It doesn't hurt to, it doesn't hurt to ask. Uh, over and over again. It helps to get other people to ask. You might have someone you know make some phone calls. Uh, one person who asks one question, it's very easy to say no. You get 12 people calling over the course of two weeks and you start thinking, especially if it's on a specific topic, then they feel the pressure to actually act. Politicians in particular um, usually only act if they're afraid of something. So with, with public pressure, of course, they, they want the votes. And so if they start getting calls from their constituents, that, uh, that they're, they want a certain action or they want some kind of public declaration, um, public pressure helps. So getting enlisting as many people as you know that, to get involved is, is very helpful. Excellent. And then okay. another, oh. another question is, how do you shine light on an issue without an honest media there to help you? At, you, at, a, at, a, at a public event or in college or does it, it in just general? In general? Well, one way is to start writing yourself. I'm going to cover some of the, the ways to, to, to do the sharing in just a minute. But you, you want to um, get into the papers. I know hard copy papers aren't as popular as they used to be, but blogs, uh, opinion columns, the most read part of a newspaper, and there are quite a few people still in the country of a certain age who still read the newspaper. And the first thing they read, and maybe the only thing they read next to the comics, are the opinion papers and the letter, or the opinion uh, op-eds or the letters to the editor. So that's one way to shine light on things. Another way is to um, maybe enlist some, some folks to, to create street theater uh, where there's some kind of an event going on. Maybe a politician is, um, oh, I don't know, maybe he's been taking too many gifts uh, and hasn't been very forthcoming about those gifts as, a, as an elected official. You could do something with some friends and stage something outside the, the courthouse or the, I'm sorry, the state complex, or the, whatever, to create some earned media that way. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Any others at the moment? Mm, not okay. right now. All right. So speaking up in public, showing up is incredibly important. Speaking up uh, in public is, is important as well. So speak up, show up, speak up. And then you're going to share. So how do you, how do you share? This goes to the last question. Uh, there's many, many different ways. Oh, I'm sorry, speaking up in private. Same idea, being respectful, but one-on-one, -on -one, where you maybe have had made an appointment with uh, an official or uh, the college administration has asked, because you've been so annoying uh, lately, they've decided they want to actually discuss something with you over lunch. And you say, yes, I, I would be happy to do that. And you speak in private. And it's the same facts. The only thing is, is during a private conversation, you can use commentary. You just want to be judicious about it. You don't want to be over. You don't want to be the only one talking. Let them do a lot of talking, and um, and kind of work, try to help them see your side of it. It may just be all um, smoke and mirrors. They might just be doing it to appease you so that they think they will get you off their back. 
uh, but uh, it, it's still an opportunity and you should take it. So, and then the, after you have a meeting with someone, whether it's a public official or an administrator, you should always send a thank you note. Be, be gracious, and, and uh, it's hard to argue with someone who's gracious and kind. All right, so how do you, you you've shown up, you're speaking up in public and private, now you're going to share this information that you've, that you've gathered. Um, and this is going to be a little bit of a long slide, but an LTE is a letter to the editor. And for the most part, those letters, they run about, they don't want them more than 250 words. If you get over 250 words, they're, they're thinking it's not a letter, it's an op-ed, it's an essay, and then you're running into that kind of murky area. Uh, but keep it at 250 words. And most regional newspapers, at least um, ones in Virginia, and I'm assuming the ones other places too, they really want a unique letter that's only for publication with them. Um, and you can get around that, and I'll tell you about that in a second. You can kind of get around it a little bit. But you want to write that letter that's about the topic, and you want to offer some sort of fact or information that the reader, you don't want to just spout off and say, I think it's horrible they're doing this, they're horrible they're doing that. You want to offer some kind of factual information and then express uh, a point of view, and that's how you get a really good letter to the editor. An op-ed is a, just a longer version of that. It's between 500 and 700 words. I have seen them go a little longer, but for the most part, most, uh, most newspapers want 500 to 700 words, and if you go longer than that, they'll cut it. And a lot of times they don't ask you if, if you want it cut. They'll cut it their way. So I have found that I give it to them at 500, 700 words, and then I say, if you want to make, it, make any changes, ask me, please, and I will work with you to, to, to make it the way you want it. Because a lot of times the editor it's not thinking like you're thinking. And uh, so you want to keep it at that point. Now, if you want to send the same op-ed to various um, organizations or different papers, you can. Uh, and to get around that idea that they, need, they want it tailored to just them, you can tailor it. One of the recent op-eds I wrote on teaching standards, um, the core of the op-ed uh, was the same, but I got it in three different papers by changing what schools I talked about. So it went into the Virginia pi Virginian pilot talking about Hampton University, talking about ODU, uh, Wesley, and those, those Tidewater schools. I got another version of it into Roanoke Times where it was talking about um, Lynchburg College and um, Virginia Tech, and, you know, JMU, the whole western side of the state. So tailoring it, and, and they asked me specifically at the Roanoke Times, they said, is this, you, you know, is this only for us? And I was honest, I said, this version is only for you. And it was true. But the core of it was the same, the idea that these teaching standards were about accountability and, the, and uh, transparency and that looking at these standards are, were important. Here's the results for these schools. It got into three different papers, um, which is uh, kind of unusual. But if, again, if you can work the system to your advantage, it's helpful. All right, petitions. Uh, with the Wren Cross at William & Mary, the, the Wren Cross uh, was the cross that was taken out of the chapel. Uh, one of our alums uh, put together a petition. You have to be careful with petitions in the sense that you really want to be asking something to happen. Uh, you, in our case, the, the, what it was to replace, the, put the cross back in the chapel. That was very simple. And we had thousands and thousands of alumni, I think it was 7,000 alumni signed the petition. It was an online petition. Um, and as one, one of our alums said, How, where, where did 7,000 alums ever agree on anything? It was, it was crazy. So we got them all together. The petition was very effective. But use it judiciously. You don't want to use it for just anything. You want it for something very, very, uh, an action that needs to be taken. You could also uh, share information with an open letter. Um, this would be a group of people, uh, maybe an organization, an association, getting together and saying, we don't like the way we're being treated. And then you get a whole bunch of people to sign it. Uh, and, and it's just a statement of concern. It's not a, you're not necessarily telling them that you want action to be taken. But it's, it's the idea that a group has come together and said, this is wrong. And we need to change it. And that, that's helpful, too. You, if you have the money, you can take out a full page ad. Uh, that's effective depending on where you're targeting your information. You can, you can uh, take out a full page ad that points out the wrongs or some factual information that's not getting put into the newspaper. So that's one way to shine light on it. You can get a group of, of people together and take uh, information on the road. You can hold different events across the state. Get on the radio, television, blogs, Twitter. I'm telling you all what you, what you already know. You use it yourself. But use it to your advantage for whatever issue that you want to promote. Having a, a web page these days is pretty cheap. I think you can get on Host Monster and some others for very little money. 
uh, for the year and then create your own website and, and have your issue spotlighted. And then every time you write an op-ed, you, you mention that website so that everyone knows to go to that. Sending emails, getting folks to send emails, having an email blast is important. And then these last few deal with lunch dates, you know, talking with the people that are important. Um, this is where it's very helpful to write a letter ahead of time asking for a meeting uh, in a respectful way. Uh, can we have lunch sometime? Can we talk? Having a phone call, having a partner. Um, at, at, at William & Mary in particular, and I'm sure it's the same way in politics, it's sometimes who you know and not how public you are. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. There was a lot that goes on behind the scenes at William & Mary. People who don't want to be public about letters or petitions, but they'll, they used to be on the board and maybe they'll call so-and-so and talk to so-and-so. And there's a lot of behind the scenes information that can get passed along that never makes it to the public, but is very effective. Very, very effective. Um, so who could, you, who could your partners be? You could get friends of friends. Uh, ask who knows somebody. Uh, sometimes when you, when you least expect it, you'll come across someone who, if you just ask nicely, they'll do it for you. And they say, oh, I know, I know him. I went to college with him. I was his college roommate. Gosh, I can ask him all kinds of things. And, but don't tell anyone I, I asked you. Uh, you can also use the Leadership Institute. Obviously, the grassroots team uh, knows how to go about getting out the vote, getting people motivated uh, to respond to an issue. Our campus field representatives work on uh, all the campuses across the country in regions, uh, organizing students, uh, conservative students in particular, to um, have an impact on their own campuses. You could always go to campusreform.org, which has been exploding uh, in the last two years with its impact. Uh, Drudge picks it up, Fox News picks it up, stories go, uh, go ballistic. Uh, when they hit campusreform.org. So feel free to contact anyone on the campusreform.org if you have a, a, a question or if you think you have a story on your, your campus, campusreform.org uh, should be able to help you, if not directly, indirectly, one way or another. Student newspapers are important, again, kind of going the way of the online uh, versions, but uh, student newspapers that are traditionally on college campuses tend to lean to the left, no surprise there. Uh, but a lot of other places are coming up with new uh, alternative newspapers, conservative newspapers, alternative newspapers to combat uh, the left. They usually are independent. They don't take money from their college university, and uh, that's a good thing. So they're not beholding to anyone, and they can report the facts uh, that are going on that maybe aren't being reported in the, in the regular school newspaper. Use your regional and local newspapers. Again, uh, make friends with the editors. It doesn't hurt to be on a first name basis with the editor of whatever paper you want to, to, be, uh, to be working with. And listen to your editors. If your editor says, I don't think this one's going to work, I think you ought to hold off on that, uh, this isn't a good one for us, try such and such, listen to them. They know what they're doing. They're in the business and they can help, you, help direct you to being the most effective that you can be. Remembering that newspapers are looking for newsworthy pieces. It may be important to you but it might not be important to what they think is to their readership. So you want to um, just keep your, keep your head level and, and be able to accept criticism, be able to say to accept no for an answer, but keep trying. Uh, on the college level, on the college side, you can turn to the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, ACTA. It's under goacta.org. They helped us at William & Mary uh, by helping us organize a new group. The National Association of Scholars puts out a lot of information on uh, curriculum and uh, what, what's a valuable, what liberal arts actually means. Minding the Campus is another organization, kind of, they're out there, it's a think, thinking organization. They, they, they talk on the issues of what's going on on campus and keep it alive and keep things um, fresh and, and bubbling up. So, any more questions? Are we still? We're good. Okay. Uh, how do you share in the long term? In the long term, you want, to, well, what we did at William & Mary, we had a, a, an, an alumni group that was ad hoc. We just, uh, nobody knew each other. We knew each other online. We got together. We got rid of the president uh, with, obviously, the help of the students on campus. And uh, once that was over, we looked around and said, boy, you know, we, we, this, there's this more going on here. We just can't just disappear. So we got together, and we actually started a 501c3. It's called the Society for the College. You get, I think, on the screen there in front of you, the, 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 the um, the website, the URL for that. It's been in existence since 2008. We are very small. We're all volunteer. Uh, we all have real jobs. Uh, and we meet four times a, a year to uh, keep things 
on an even keel for being a 501c3. We also do fundraising and we hold events at the college. It is a struggle to get events at the college because they don't consider it, because we don't take money from them. We have absolutely no money coming in from them and they do not want, they do not want us to be on campus. So they charge us an arm and a leg whenever we want to do something. It's crazy. But we are not, we're all alumni or faculty or students um, and we're part of the college as well. But it's, it's been an interesting experience trying to keep it up and not be seen as the devil with, you know, two horns coming out of your head. We're all, we just want the better, the better interest of the college and to bring forward uh, information that is not being brought forward by the, what we would call, yes, the regular alumni association, the one that gets $1.5 million of its budget from the college. They are not going to say anything negative about the school and um, we're just trying to be constructive. So here is our website. If anyone's interested, you can go on here, see our latest. Uh, we try to keep things up to date with um, the issues. Again, the curriculum is, is the big issue right now. They're trying to dumb down the curriculum at William & Mary and it's not good. So that's a long-term share. If, you wanna, if you're into that, it's, it's, it's not easy to do it, but if you really are committed, it can happen. Now, when you're, dig when you're digging, if you're going to dig for information, <clears throat> John Adams said facts are stubborn things, and he was right. And when you're looking for the facts, sometimes they're not easy to find, hence the mountain of paper sitting here. Um, we have, you know, you have, sometimes you have to dig through some really dry reading, like the bylaws, looking through minutes, meeting minutes, memos, um, for elected officials, the congressional record uh, through the Library of Congress is an exceptional source so that you can find out exactly how your representatives are voting, uh, what bills they put forward, what their success rate is, that sort of thing. The Sunlight Foundation is an, that's an excellent nonprofit, again, trying to sh shine light on the issues so that the truth comes out. It's all about the truth. OpenCongress.org, another organization that puts forward the records that are public, inform it's public information, it's just hard to get through sometimes. You, video records from the students helps to go to the county courthouse. Uh, there's a lot of information that can be dug up in a county courthouse. Newspaper archives, and I know that I know. I hate to say the young people. I, I feel so old. That that uh, most a lot of folks seem to think everything's on the internet and it's free. It's not. <coughs> <laughs> it's not. Newspaper archives. Some of your best sources for information on what someone was doing 15 years ago uh, aren't going to be online, and if they are for a fee. It's a subscription. So I recommend that you um, either explore your local library or if you're here in Washington go to the Library of Congress and uh, utilize their databases. It'll be an eye-opener for you. Uh, OpenSecrets.org, I may have that twice. Your Federal Elections Commission for funding uh, where people are getting their money. Your State Board of Elections has a lot of information about uh, voters and things like that. Uh, and well, just use the internet. Use the internet as much as you can. There's a lot of information out there. Not all of it is free. Do what you can. So I do have a question from a uh, viewer at home. Are there, there has to be certain issues that unite everyone or are all issues polarizing? Can you think of anything that would unite people so you can start with a, a good coalition as a jumping off point? For, pol for public policy? Mm-hmm. Good question. What do you think, Patty? <laughs> Turn the question over. You know, a lot of things are polarizing, but I, I think if, if you get away from the extremes and kind of go towards the center, most people will say they love America and they, they, they love what America offers and one way or another. And if you can focus on the positive things, you know, find the common ground. Where, where, are, we, where are we on the same side? And start with that and then again talking respectfully you can maybe flush things out a little bit but you know one of the things and if I'm gonna I'm going to get on my soapbox here a little bit one of the things conservatives I think don't do well and that is that going outside their own box they like to we like to kind of hang out with our own and we don't want to go out and talk that yet you, know, you really do have to engage other folks of all all backgrounds all opinions you have to engage them in order to actually have them realize, one, they're not, they're not the only ones out there, that there are people that think differently. And I think that's one of the reasons I got involved in this sort of activity is that 
uh, one, for example, at William & Mary, go back to the, my major experience with William & Mary, I was living down in Williamsburg at the time when they took the cross out of the chapel, and I was making my way around uh, the campus and the various um, organizations, you know, the, the fire department or the police chief and whatever. I was stunned by how many people would pull me aside. These are staffers on the college who would pull me aside and whisper, we're on your side. We really are. We really are on your side. Go get them. But they weren't willing to take a stand, and they weren't willing to stand up, and they were intimidated. So I think if conservatives actually start reaching out it, you'll, and say there is common ground and trying to find that. It's hard, though. It's hard because there's some people on the left who just don't know any better, and, and they, they don't want to have their minds changed. So I don't know if I have a good answer for that one. That's good enough for me right now. <laughs> okay. Anything else on that one? Uh, no. It's just basically it's what I have seen when holding elected officials accountable is if you go in there combative to start, then you're probably not going to get very far. It's because you're pushing each other up against the wall and defensiveness right, is, the, is and a natural re reaction. Right. And instead, if you go in there cordial and ready to have a discussion, you're more likely to get farther mm -hmm. than you were if you were going in there with demands only. Right. Right. And that's. I, I think I think that, that says a lot right there. I think one of my in, in the experience I've had is. Um, because I show up to all these meetings and I'm not really welcome. I mean, they really, they really don't want me there. Um, I, it's hard to engage because they know I, I'm going to write about it. And they, they, they are in intimidated by me a little bit. And so I'm in a little bit of a different position. But when I have had the ability, like they bring in new board members. And so I was like, hi, I'm, I'm Carla Bruno. Nice to meet you. You, you know, there, there's kind of at least an onset of, well, okay, she's not that horrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's actually, you know, why are you doing this? Because I, I love the college. I love the college. I don't hate the college. I love it. I, w I spend so much of my free time doing this. Right. And I think it's yeah. if people, if you develop a human relationship with someone, that it's no longer you against them. Right. It's you against the, what they stand for. It's the, the policy. The concepts. The, the concepts. concepts. It's, it's, has, it's nothing personal. It's if you develop a relationship with someone, yeah. that's why I think that in, if you see in Congress, there are certain congressmen that work together across the aisle. Right. And it's because they develop a mutual respect for each other and they realize it has nothing to do with the person. It has everything sure. to do with the policy. And one of the greatest examples I've heard of that recently is that um, Supreme Court Justice uh, Scalia mm -hmm. spends every New Year's Eve with the Ginsburgs, their families. Oh wow! I do this? Yeah. yeah, I would not have predicted that. That is but a. I heard him say that at one New point. New Year's Eve party. I wonder. Uh, it would be in a, in a, but the <laughs> families are good friends. They get along very well, and there's a lot of respect there on totally opposite sides mm -hmm. of the of the uh, political spectrum. So I think a little little consideration goes a long way. Absolutely. Okay. Next one. Mm -hmm. Let's go. All right. All right. FOIA. Uh, I'm going to assume most people know what it is, but for those of you who, who don't, FOIA stands for the Freedom of Information Act, one of the few things that Congress ever did that was really worthwhile. Uh, it's the freedom to, for any citizen to petition a government agency for their records. And you don't have to have a reason. Uh, you don't have to be anyone but a citizen of the, of the state. In, in Virginia, you have to be a, a, from Virginia in order to petition a Virginia institution. And the caveat, of course, here is that if you are at a private university and have troubles, you cannot FOIA a private university. That's, that's, that's the problem. This is all government related. It's so uh, at William & Mary, we could FOIA things. It's, it, help, it helps if you, when you want to do a FOIA, uh, you want to make a request, it helps to have a lawyer do it. If not, you know, paying someone in a legal area, but if you have someone in your team that's a lawyer and can write it kind of legally and sound and intimidating with it, it, it comes off uh, a little better. It gets you a little more res respect from the, from the other side. That's the good news, is that the Freedom of Information Act exists and you can petition for the information. The bad news is, is that they, on the other side, um, can take their time, they can drag their feet, they can charge you a fee uh, depending on how many man hours it takes to get whatever it is they want to, uh, to, to, to you want delivered. And 
I mean, there's time limits. They still, you know, they, but they can they can drag it on for a little while. So it's not a fast answer, but you, you should be able to get it. I know at William and Mary, I had some trouble getting some information. I asked just directly. I didn't even invoke FOIA. I asked uh, one of the board members for some information or one of the staff members, and I, I feet were dragging and feet were dragging, and finally I went to the uh, FOIA officer at William and Mary, and she got it for me very quickly. Uh, so it, you know, there can be someone on campus, or if there's a FOIA officer involved, that's their job, is to make sure that FOIA is enforced. And so you make them your friend as well. Now what you see on the screen in front of you is the uh, wonderful story from last year at the Leadership Institute. Uh, the team from CampusReform.org actually did a FOIA at the University of Minnesota, Duluth, and uh, they were actually looking for something else. They were actually looking for something else and got a stack of paper probably this high, probably three to four feet high. And um, one of our staff members was uh, looking through it. And in the middle of all of this stack of paper, he found what was called the unfair campaign. The photo, is, uh, hopefully it's on the screen in front of you, uh, is from that campaign. The university was paying for it. It's a state university paying for a, uh, a video uh, event they basically had white folks saying how unfair it is to be white uh, and that every privilege that any white person has is because they're white. It's got nothing to do with, with any, of earning anything. It has all to do with the color of your skin. So this came our way at campusreform.org. We um, put some pressure on them. A story went viral. We had over 275,000 hits in a couple of days on our website. And within 10 days, the university first came out and said, no, no, we stand behind this program. It's perfectly fine. It's wonderful. And, but after 10 days of pressure from campus reform and folks uh, from in the Minnesota area or all over the country claiming that it's unfair to have this un unfair campaign, they actually took it down. So it was a huge success story. Um, but it was a little serendipity in the midst of a huge pile of paper. He just happened to come across it. So it can happen. It doesn't always happen. But FOIA is a, is a good thing. So any, if you have time, I shouldn't go on to the next story. If you have only, or if you're only going to read two books this year, and I recommend you read 100 books, but if you're only going to read two, you should read Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky or and or Confrontational Politics. Both of them will give you the tools you need to fight the fight either on campus or against uh, public officials that are unprincipled and, and uh, not going the way of liberty and freedom. Uh, the, Saul Alinsky, of course, is a famous radical, leftist radical, and it just goes to prove that political technology is neutral, that the ideas work on both sides. It's not a function of um, the concept. It's not the, the political idea. It's the technology. It works for both sides. If it works for the left, it can work for us as well. There is a question. Mm -hmm. okay. And talking about Think Progress, um, one of our viewers calls it a beacon of ignorance, <laughs> which is a, an interesting term for sure. Yeah. And they said, I think it would be a great idea to form a coalition of conservative friends, friends to politely and intellectually disrupt the articles Think Progress produces uh, by numerically outwitting the conversations under each post on their website to get a and I think what saying is help me out with this whenever they whenever they have a new post it's getting people to just comment under everything with to is it is it effective to do so what kind of people read think progress or would it be more effective to uh, combat those thoughts in a more mainstream mm -hmm. uh, media, like a Huffington Post, which sure. leans left, sure. but it's more widely read right. than Think Progress. Right. What would what would you do? Well, two two things come to mind. Number number one is that yeah, you want to always leverage your time and effort and energy into the most effective means possible. And and in my opinion, my opinion, and it's just my opinion, but the commentary at the after uh, articles that are being posted. Um, is pretty much just venting and people go back and forth and, and it's not necessarily productive. 
Um, I, it could be entertaining, but I, I don't know how productive it is. I don't know that anyone's ever actually changed their mind based on reading, you know, commentary after an article. And I'd say that on both sides. It doesn't matter whether it's a left or a right or a moderate. I, I personally find that the commentary section of any posting is, is pretty much a waste of my time. Okay. So, <laughs> but that's that's just me. I, what do you? I mean, Patty, have you had a different? I think that uh, people who really are interested in the debate tend to always read at least the top 10 comments okay. uh, underneath because that's when you get a someone that can say I definitely agree with what is written here or I disagree and here's some other resources if you want to. So it's actually a way to, to like I said, com combat what is being written if it is, if it is a lie and especially with left-leaning media yeah. that if they aren't writing the truth or a half-truth or they're spinning an issue in their favor because they want to win the argument, because yeah. what yeah. we want to do is yeah. win the argument, yeah. that that is an act a tactic will, that can be used. Well, I will tell you, I, will tell you, I saw success in that realm in, in, in with the William & Mary saga. When, when Jean Nichol um, resigned in 2008, he, of course, pretended that it was all, you know, he was a martyr and he was being, you know, slammed and, and whatnot. And there were newspapers uh, that picked up, and bloggers that picked up that thread. They followed whatever he was leading with. And um, what we did was we gathered the five, four local newspapers, the stu two student newspapers and the two local newspapers, two of which were pro-nickel and two of which were anti-nickel, so they were split. Um, but all four of them and came out and said after he resigned, you know, he needed to go. He, he, had, he had lied. He had, you know, done all kinds of things that were, you know, not conducive to being a good president and he needed to go. So that was unanimous. And so one response to that was to post on those on mm -hmm. those on those and it did stop the media from so it didn't change necessarily anybody who was commentating commentate comment commenting sorry no it didn't change people who were commenting but it stopped the the media from going with Nichols side of it from from taking his side of it so there was an effective uh, an effective use of it at that point so maybe I just changed my mind excellent <laughs> <laughs> see we're never experts fully well, I, we know, always learn different things, and, especially and tactics. It, tactics are, are always important, and you'd use what's effective. Mm -hmm. and, and in that case, that was one of those th times where it, again, didn't affect the people who were commenting on things. In fact, if I, if I remember correctly, that was the only, you know, like the third comment down was the one about, no, here are the, here are the four links. You want to see these four editors who said that this man needed to go, and that just pretty much stopped that train from chewing down the track. So I guess I guess I've read too many kind of weird comments on things. Maybe I'm not reading the right things. So wonderful. That's, okay, you got one more? Mm -hmm. Okay, well actually I've got just uh, two interesting photographs that um, the one is inspirational is of course from 1989. Of course hopefully you were born back then or mm, maybe not. <laughs> I was born in 81. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you were 8 years old when this was going yes. on. Yes. Okay. So 1989 Tiananmen Square. Student Uprising, student for liberty, Students for Liberty, and uh, this young man stood in front of the tanks uh, to stop the, the rolling through. It was a protest. Famous photograph. Uh, what I like about it is the next one, which is um, a distant view. Somebody took one pic, same picture, same, same, same moment in time taken from a distance. So this young man wasn't standing in front of three tanks, which is brave enough. You know, one tank is brave enough, but he was standing in front of the, the whole line of the communists. Uh, to, uh, tanks rolling through, and I think that's just inspirational. Um, I did some research recently trying to find out what happened to this young man, and no one seems to know what happened to him. Um, no one can confirm or deny uh, his, what happened to him after that. But there is always a way, there is always a way to get your voice heard. You don't have to stand in front of a tank, uh, but you can get to victory at the next exit. And this is my information. If anyone wants to email me, I'm, I'm Open for business. The questions. Wonderful. Um, I just have a quick question. Sure. What do you, for someone who is just starting out, that they are outraged by something that is happening, what is that first step that you would tell them? This is the one thing that you have to do before you take on the challenge of holding your, an elected official accountable. Get your facts. Make sure your facts are straight. Do not listen to what everyone's just saying at the moment. In the heat of the moment, so much information goes flying around and you're not really sure. 
um, and you really need to make sure that what you're talking about is accurate. Uh, finding out, you know, did that really happen that way? Is this is this the reality? Was anyone asked? Did anyone ask did, uh, about you know, this? What prompted this action? What didn't prompt that action? How do we know? You know, being being as clear as you can on the facts because facts are stubborn things. <laughs> well, Carla, thank you so much. Uh, definitely learned a lot. Had a great discussion back and forth, and I hope everyone who was watching at home can now have the confidence to go out there and really make a difference and hold your elected officials accountable, whether it be on campus or on Capitol Hill. Want to remind you again that this was recorded and you will be able to view it within uh, the next week. So thank you very much. Tune in two weeks from now. It'll be 3 p.m. on a Wednesday. I'm not sure the topic, but we will be emailing you out uh, an answer to that, what the next webinar will be. But thanks again. Have a great night.